Good morning, Good morning and welcome to the service of worship at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. My name is Reverend Bethany Russell Lowe and I have the great pleasure and honor of serving this congregation. Our community is as varied as the blooms of the Sonoran Desert. Whoever you are, whoever you've been and whoever you are in the path to becoming, I invite you to bring your whole self here and now. I'm coming to you this morning, as you can tell, from my home, recording on Saturday afternoon, because my family and I have caught COVID. We're doing all right. Luckily, we all have mild cases, the three of us, me and my husband, Brian, and the baby, Otis, but we are still in our quarantine period, so I cannot be with you live this morning. Thank you to Brenda and Brian and Jamili and the whole AV team for the ways that they each have pitched in this morning in my physical absence. And through meeting with me and some other people in their lives, I wanted to let you know that a number of the worship leaders this morning have had known COVID exposure in the past two to three days. Everyone has tested negative and has been monitoring themselves for symptoms the past few days. We've been communicating with one another about that. And we wanna be transparent with you about this so that if you are live there with us in Holland, you can make an informed decision about your presence there today. We are a covenantal community, which means that we make promises with each other about how we are together when we are together. And in this time of continuing pandemic, wearing masks, practicing some degree of social distancing if that's requested, and getting vaccinated are all part of our covenant with each other. So if you are in person in Holland with us this morning, our hope is that you are vaccinated, as vaccinated as you can be. And if you are choosing not to be vaccinated, we hope that you will join us online next week. Extend a special welcome this morning to any visitors and invite you to fill out a guest information card. If you're joining us on YouTube, our YouTube chat host this morning, Janice Hejo, will post a link in the chat right about now. Thank you, Jesse, for filling in for Mary this morning on YouTube. And there will also be a welcome table at social hour if you're there in person in Goddard. And we invite visitors to fill out a guest information card there. There will be social hour right after the service in person in Goddard. There'll be coffee and lemonade and snacks. All are invited to join us there. Our treasurer, Linda French, asked me to relay to you all that this is a historically tough time of year to make income and, and expense balance month to month. So if you are in a position to pay your pledge for the year up front or pay a portion of it up front, um, or just give a little extra donation to help us get through this historically low giving time, that would, um, that would help a lot, help us get to the fall when donations and pledges usually pick up. You can do that by putting a check in the offering plate and just putting pledge, if it's a pre-pledge pledge on it, or you can go online uh, to uuctucson.org slash donate. And also another announcement, look out in the e-blast this week for more information about a first aid CPR class we are hosting on August 20th. The fee will be from $0 to $45, sliding scale, give what you can. We're looking for a few folks to pay that full fee if they can though. If you want to attend or want more information, go ahead and contact Jamili either this morning or give her an email. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Reverend Kimberly Ann Tomsack Carlson. She writes, it is not by chance that you have arrived here today. You have been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you, there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggles, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to the possibilities of love, a home heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. Welcome home, welcome to worship. Good morning. My name is Brenda Lunt, and I am your worship associate this morning. Will everyone please join me in our chalice lighting words by Reverend Jennifer Grayson. A mug of coffee, lit candle, and a and pair of glasses rests on a tray made of a slice of log. No, that's not on your part. I don't know, that might be an old one. <laughs> Let's try again, together. We light this chalice a symbol of our purpose to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice knowing our congregation as a church dispersed across communities, not bound by walls, but connected through the web of life. Now, if you have a chalice or candle at home, please light it as we light our chalice here in Holland. Once in a while, a smile will say, there's still love with you today, sharing with us what we knew long ago, and helping the bonds to always grow. Now and again, you know the words will not Sign a smile from you, a powerful message. One smile can be a simple reminder. We all need to see. Once in a while, you got to smile. Once in a while, you got to smile. Once in a while, 
Give us a smile. Have you ever been up to Colossal Cave or uh, there's another tourist area where they do this thing up at the visitor center in the before times? You could go to the, to the visitor center and you could get a little bag of dirt and you put the dirt, I'm seeing some recognition here, you put the dirt in this shaker sieve thing and you shake, shake, shake. You gotta shake the dirt, not your body, right? Shake, shake, shake. Clearly, it's a lot of fun. It's also a lot of hard work because you gotta get all that dirt out of there. But these beautiful gems emerge out of something that just looks like dirt. Fellow UU Christopher Buse reminds us that liberal religious education is a lot like shifting dirt. A lot like gem mining is what he would call it. Our religious and education, we endeavor to teach discernment to our children, and I would say to our adults too. The word discernment comes from the Latin. Somebody with better Latin than me, correct me. Discerne? Question which means to separate, to distinguish, to sort out, just like shaking that mesh with rocks in it. In other words, we teach our children how to be gem miners. We take the dirt, the many views, traditions, opinions, all of the input that comes into them, to place it in our strainer, which might be our hearts or our minds, run the creek water through it, our ideas, the loving guidance of others, of other adults and children, and sift, sift, sift until we find the gems. Liberal religious education, gem mining, requires the ability to discern what is worth keeping and what we should sift out and discard. This can be difficult. We have all have to sift through a lot of information all the time. News, media, books, our friends, our not so much friends who are giving us opinions, so much information. And whether we like it or not, we are learning and testing our values with and through every interaction that we have. What do we do? I've often argued for a tiny house on the side of Mount Lemmon. Probably not. We can take social media and news vacations, but we can't stay isolated forever. The truth is, we just cannot shelter in place for all times, and we cannot shelter our children forever. But, but, we can learn the process of discernment, of teaching us all to sift through the valuable and the invaluable and keep those gems close to hand. And at some point, we have to open the door and say, out into the world, as God spoke to the children of Israel, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cur curses, choose. Our earth is strong. It can hold our pain and our joy, our love and our anger. Our shared bowl, which we use for joys and concerns each week, is strong enough to hold the big rocks, our collective celebrations and mornings, and also the smaller stones that will be added to signify our individual joys and sorrows. We who live in the desert know that water is a life-sustaining and scarce resource. Let's remember those who are walking through our desert right now without access to water. We pour water from a plastic jug, similar to those used by our ministry partners, No More Death, to help assure greatest access to water. If you have a joy or sorrow to share, I invite you to go to menti.com and put in the code 9058-8542. Those directions are on your screen. You can do that from your phone, from your computer, wherever you are. If you are here in person, I also invite, 
I additionally invite you to come to the table and put a stone in the water to symbolize your joy or sorrow. The pebbles create ripples of hope. Doesn't look like anybody added to our Mentimeter this morning. Um, normally we read, these at, read those at this time, but instead let's just take a moment of silence for the joys and concerns that were not spoken or able to be shared this morning. Our prayer comes from David White and is titled, Sometimes. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross with a shimmering bed of leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests, conceived out of nowhere, but in this place, beginning to lead everywhere. Request to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. The offering that we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place and to these people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something we value. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May I, our offering help us practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as tools to empower our mission. If you are joining us live on live stream this morning, you can send a check to the office or give online at uuctucson.org slash donate or text 833-361 Five seven nine six. If you are here in person, Carolyn is in the back with the offering bowl. You can oh, and Kate over here too. You're welcome to put them in now or on your way out this morning. Mm -hmm.
Our reading today comes from religious educator and spiritual director, Reverend Carrie Kopnick, called Letters After My Name, from the volume To Wake, To Rise. She writes, I pulled another basket of steaming dishes out of the dishwasher in our church basement. My partner in kitchen cleanup grabs a clean dish towel and dabs the pools of water from the upturned soup bowls. They ask, so what's your undergrad in? The conversation that happens in church kitchens are my absolute favorites. I have been washing dishes in church basements since I was 11. Kitchen ministry fills my heart, but not this time, not this conversation. I know the look I'll get. I know they won't mean harm, but I can feel the shame creep from my heart to my face. I am staff here. They may pay me a chunk from their operating budget to direct the ministry with their children and their teens. Surely I have a degree, preferably a master's degree, likely even a professional license of some kind too. Actually, I don't. I didn't finish my undergrad. I turned to load the next round of soup bowls, and while I want to say I was close to a degree in child psych, if I move back to that state, I'll finish up. But I just spray the bowls with a restaurant-style sprayer. Bits of barley and carrots fly everywhere. The conversation stops. My eyes don't linger to see the raised eyebrows, the quick flash of judgment. It's not that I didn't want to finish school. I just came from a working class family where college visits and choosing the right school were a foreign world. My high school teachers didn't see anything special in me. My brain functions more like a modern dance number done in the woods upside down than a neat, tidy ballet performance of Swan Lake. So I tumbled out of high school, headed where my friends went, to a big public research institution that was all about third position and absolutely no woods. It's not surprising, I left early, feeling stupid. I worked in what could have been the Ms. Magazine top 10 low wage jobs for women until my Unitarian Universalist congregation needed a religious educator, and I applied. We were wildly successful, doubling the number of registered children and then doubling again. We won an award for growth and innovation and finally had to buy a church building to house our booming congregation. I served on district and continental boards for my professional association, and my blog was often featured in the denominational magazine. But I never applied to be formally credentialed. How could I? I would have had to face the credentialing committee without any letters after my name. My faith says all are welcome. My faith says we are all whole and holy and good. I myself have said this to dozens of children and teens. And yet, we have miles to go to make this so. This month, I am completing my 10th year of professional work in Unitarian Universalist congregations. It's hard for me to believe, it might be hard for some of you to believe, but I have been on staff in a large 800 member congregation, an intern in a small and a medium sized congregations. I've been a consulting minister in a congregation of 18 members, and now I'm a settled minister here in Tucson. And I've learned a lot about church in those 10 years. My most valuable lesson is that I am still learning. And to be clear, this lesson does not arise primarily from humility. It arises primarily from the nature of doing ministry in the 21st century. There is so little This month, I am com This month, I am completing my 10th
This month, I am completing my 10th year of professional work in Unitarian Universalist congregations. It's hard for me to believe. It might be hard for some of you to believe. But I have been on staff in a large 800-member congregation, an intern in a small and a medium-sized congregations. I've been a consulting uh, minister in a congregation of 18 members. And now I'm a settled minister here in Tucson. And I've learned a lot about church in those 10 years. My most valuable lesson is that I am still learning. And to be clear, this lesson does not arise primarily from humility. It arises primarily from the nature of doing ministry in the 21st century. There is so little that is certain about the future of church. There is certainly not one way to do what we are striving to do. Now, this post-pandemic time, this time when not as many people are coming to church, where it's not as cultural of a thing to do, now is a time that is ripe for innovation, for turning things on their head, for trying things differently. And this can be really exciting for a lot of people. And it can be really scary for a lot of people, even us Unitarian Universalists, because we are a very smart people. We have done a lot. We have read a lot. We know a lot. We are a learned people. According to a 2014 Pew Research Survey, 67% of Unitarian Universalists have a college degree and another 23% have some college under their belt. The only denomination or religious group that is more educated than Unitarian Universalists are Hindus. And notably to me, well, contrast this, I'm sorry, contrast this with 27% of adults in the US have completed a college degree. So 67% of Unitarian Universalists, 27% of adults in the US. And among these statistics, while we're there, notably to me, of the people who describe themselves as atheists and agnostics, 43% and 42% respectively have a college degree. And of people who say they have no religion in particular, 24% have a college degree. The contrast in this data illustrates the landscape behind Carrie's story, which Brenda read for our reading today. We Unitarian Universalists are at least twice as likely to have a college degree than the general population. And that's not even to take into account all of our master's degrees and PhDs and other advanced degrees. We are a learned people. There's a joke in our congregation that it would take a PhD to turn on the air conditioning. And in that room that some of you are sitting in, that is. For those of you who don't know, turning on our over 50-year-old HVAC for the sanctuary is a multi-step, multi-room process that involves two doors, two keys, one gate, at least four switches or buttons. Thankfully, we've got construction plans to replace that HVAC soon and we'll make the process of turning it on much easier for everybody. And the reality of the joke is that it doesn't take a PhD to turn on the HVAC, but it does take another fountain of knowledge. Our sexton, our custodian, Jesus, has been working with us for over 20 years, and he certainly knows how to turn on the HVAC, and he can identify a lot of reasons that it might not be working correctly, among many other skills and wisdom that he brings to his role here. Among the most impressive skills that I know about Jesus is his ability to be just around the corner when I'm looking for him. Have any of you noticed that skill that he has? I was meeting with colleagues this week and one of them, much longer tenured in ministry than myself, commented how very little of seminary prepared her for day-to-day -day ministry, which was a relief to this still novice minister. The one thing she said that she gleaned from seminary, which has been indispensable to her in ministry, was learning about boundaries. Thinking back to my own seminary experience just about 10 years ago, we were required to take a course on boundaries. 
a whole two hour course and a three year full time experience that was tangential to every other course. And this two hour course didn't even count for credit. Two hours, no credit, indispensable. I worked at churches throughout my seminary education. I went part time in school. And there is, that is where I learned about boundaries the most. I was kind of thrown in the deep end, actually. My first week working in church, a lifelong member of the congregation told me, a 20-something new hire, that he would, in his words, take his marbles and go elsewhere if I didn't do the thing he wanted me to do. When talking through that experience with my supervisor, she assured me that my authority meant more to her than his marbles and that he wasn't a big pledger anyways, even though he was known to flaunt his privilege often. I learned a lot about boundaries in that congregation. There are some things that academic pursuits did not, do not, cannot teach us. Wisdom, learning is gleaned from a combination of academic, academics, life experience, self-taught lessons, social knowledge, and more. In their book, Emergent Strategy, Adrienne Marie Brown wrote, transformation doesn't happen in a linear way, at least not one we can always track. It happens in cycles, convergences, explosions. If we release the framework of failure, we can realize that we are in iterative cycles and we can keep asking ourselves, how do I learn from this? As Brown points out, wisdom is not only something that happens in academic institutions. It is also, it is something that is dynamic, always moving everywhere available to us. It is impossible in this framework to be learned. We are a learning people. The Unitarian Universalist Association of Ministers, my professional association, used to have in our covenant that we are a learned people. It reflected a centuries old sentiment that we value education and also this false idea that the static nature of being learned, being wise, which gave this impression that wisdom is a goal to be attained rather than a path to follow. A number of years ago, I'm sure after this having been pointed out a lot of times, we changed that language to call ourselves a learning people. And we talk a lot about what came along with that shift in language. We started naming when we made mistakes a lot more often. And when mistakes were made publicly, public apology happened. We began to really honor life experience as wisdom equal to academic and professional learning. We began to realize that whether we were green or long tenured or somewhere in between in our profession, we all had something to contribute that was equally valuable. Being learned is a false idol which distracts us from our true nature. We humans are always learning. As the swirl of anti-racism and how to support and welcome trans and non-binary folks, how to crack open that wide world of disability justice, as all this swirls around us in culture, we too get caught up in that swirl, sometimes confused in that swirl. Even committed Unitarian Universalists can feel the tension being, of being asked to acknowledge their learning nature as that swirl happens and we are brought into its spiral. If we lean into the idea of being a learning people, understanding our true nature that way, we'll learn to, to say the phrase, I don't know. It will begin to slip off our tongues more easily. We will become flexible open to new ideas, and sometimes, sometimes willing to be in a state of discomfort and recognize that as part of the learning process. We will become gem miners rather than jewel collectors. We will, at the invitation of the story this morning, take the stuff of this world and sift and look and discern 
the art of discerning, of pulling apart the world and choosing where our values lead us is the posture of a learning people. The late Sophia Lyon Faz, a behemoth of a religious educator in our movement, encouraged us to let our religious education be driven by the questions of the seeker. In one of her books, she writes about the process of taking children out into nature and letting their questions guide the lesson. Curiosity can be a curriculum. We are all always like children with questions that swirl in our hearts and minds and bodies. And sometimes this world feeds us the false narrative that when we know more, we question less. But anyone who has committed hours and hours to learn about anything knows it is very much the reverse. The more we know, the more questions we have, the more curious we can be. So friends, Let's go gem mining in our congregations, in our lives. Let's discern what is left for us to learn. Let's honor the wis that wisdom comes from a variety of life experiences and none is better than or superior to another. Let us lean into learning, discovering about this world, our community, our congregations, ourselves. May curiosity and wonder guide you forward today and in the week ahead. May this posture set you on the path towards more love, more joy, and more awe. Amen, and blessed be. Our closing words today come from Filipino Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Tat Gilardo. They write, some came here to be blessed with answers in a tumultuous world. Let us hope too, however, that many of us have been blessed with questions. 
to direct us with a clarity of mind, to steer our logic towards kindness and justice always. Will you please join me in saying our words of chalice extinguishing by Vanessa Williams? Let me check them. There we go. <laughs> like the flame of the chalice, may the flame of our hearts burn, remaining unextinguished. May it ignite our energies, our drive, our resolve to dream, to build, and live into the world that good which exists for now only in our imaginings. <laughs>